I left off the last lecture with this rather poignant quote from the American poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. The United States will conquer Mexico, but it will be as the man swallows arsenic, which brings him down in turn. Mexico will poison us. The fruits of that poison already became evident before the war with Mexico had ended. Uh, in August of 1846, during the House's debate on budget appropriations for the war with Mexico, Pennsylvania Democrat David Wilmot rose up and proposed an amendment to the bill attaching a proviso which read, quote, that as an express and fundamental condition of the acquisition of any territory from the Republic of Mexico, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude shall ever exist in any part of the said territory, end of quote. That, of course, becomes known as the Wilmont Proviso. And we can see from this map just exactly what that is going to entail and the kind of opposition that will trigger down in the South. Again, um, you can see here the acquisitions, how the continental United States as we know it today essentially was formed as a result of this war as Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, and California are going to be carved out of former Mexican territory. And this, of course, the Wilmont Proviso is going to set the South off once again. Um, many of the, many Southerners were volunteers fighting in California and in Texas. They were already making plans for introducing their slaves into the tin and silver mines of New Mexico regions. And they saw the Wilmot Proviso as just another example of the North's attempt to box in slave state representation in Congress by barring further entry of slave states. There's a myriad of motives behind the Wilmont Proviso beyond just the question of slavery. First of all, this is a proposal that comes from a Democrat, mind you, a Northern Democrat, a Pennsylvania Democrat, but of course the Democratic Party is going to be associated with slavery. And this is an example of how the Democratic Party is beginning to itself fall apart between Southern factions and Northern factions of the Democratic Party. Northern Democrats, um, who, who are not necessarily dedicated anti-slavery activists, but they're angry, they're resentful of what they felt was Polk's favoritism of the South and the South's domination of the Senate. There's as well some resentment left over from another conflict that was occurring just before the Mexican War. And this was the question of Oregon, um, Oregon country and the Columbia District in the West. Um, this territory, as you can see, between the 42nd parallel at the bottom and the 54th 40 minute line on the extreme north is a territory along the Pacific that is in dispute between Britain and the United States. The British claim the 42nd parallel as their lowest point in the, the border of this Pacific Coast territory. And, and that would mean if history just continued without the Mexican War and the, the British prevailed, it would mean that Canada today would have bordered on Mexico. Of course, uh, 
um, all that history changes. The Americans on their extreme are claiming right up to the border with Alaskan Russia, the 5440 line. That's the extreme U.S. claim. And in, in, in fact, um, the war Democrats are calling for war with Britain over this territory. The, the, the um, call, in fact, is 5440 or fight. That's the slogan of the war Democrats. Polk, of course, uh, smartly doesn't want to go to war. Uh, not with Britain. And, and in fact, Polk is going to say something like um, one war at a time. And, and so in order to press the war in Mexico, Polk ends up on the West Coast making a compromise with Britain. And so the border is settled at the 49th parallel like this with a slight bend around um, Vancouver Island, which remains Canadian territory south of the 49th parallel. But that essentially sets up in 1846, the current border that we enjoy with the United States today. But this of course leaves both war Democrats resentful and as well Northern Democrats resentful as well over these splits occurring within the Democratic Party over um, the, the, the settlement of various territory. And, you know, Van Buren Democrats, they're still angry about Southern Democrats blocked against their candidate back in the 1844 nomination convention. Um, and so some of them, even though they, um, you know, support it, the kind of slave power in the South, um, they sometimes joined uh, the Northern Democrats to, uh, I'm sorry, I just got to pause here for a second. There we go. They sometimes, um, joined the Northern Democrats in their uh, opposition to the, the, the war in Mexico. Polk's veto of a rivers and harbor bill and tariff reductions angered Northern Democrats as well in the industrial and Great Lake regions. Um, and as Gideon Wells, a Connecticut Democratic congressman and later Secretary of the Navy under Lincoln, uh, who, by the way, is a Republican, um, he, at that time, as a congressman, proclaims, he's a Democratic congressman, that the time has come when the Northern democracy should make a stand. Everything has taken a Southern shape and been controlled by Southern caprice for years. We must satisfy the Northern people that we're not to extend the institution of slavery as a result of this war. So the Wilmot Proviso is going to further wrench party loyalty apart. Um, Northern Whigs who were ideologically anti-slavery were happy to align themselves with Northern Democrats who couldn't care less about slavery, but had their own particular agendas behind the Wilmot Proviso. In the South, meanwhile, Southern Whigs and Democrats now begin to align together across party lines. And so this process is polarizing the American party system beyond just party lines. It's polarizing it into geographical poles of North versus South. John C. Calhoun once again comes into the picture, introducing yet another doctrine on top of the Calhoun doctrine. Um, Calhoun argues that there is a so-called common property doctrine. He argues that unincorporated territories were the common property of all the states and that Congress had no right 
to prevent citizen of any state from, quote, immigrating with their property, end of quote, i.e. slaves. And so Calhoun argues that territory under control of the United States, but not yet admitted as a state, is common property of all the states, slaveholding states and um, non-slaveholding states. But just by default, that would mean that slave owners should be able to, as he says, emigrate to their own um, territories with their slaves until that territory becomes incorporated as a state and at, you know, at which point it would have decided whether it's going to be a state or, or not. And so now comes the question of incorporating Oregon territory as that British borderline at the 49th parallel is now confirmed. And what is going to happen with all this territory now, which is under the United States control, but um, no one is admitted as a state other than the state of Texas, which of course triggered the war. There's all sorts of underhanded um, attempts to bring slavery into this um, process. One, there, there, there's even this kind of underhanded attempt where southern states introduce a piece of legislation that they hope that like senators today nobody would have uh, properly read um, southern states propose a bill incorporating the territory of oregon the bill that they draft proposes applying the Missouri Compromise provi uh, provision to the clause, banning slavery in Oregon by adding, this is slaveholding states. They're, they're going to introduce a provision banning slavery in Oregon by adding a sentence which reads, quote, in so much as the whole of the territory lies north of the 3630 North latitude, the Missouri Compromise line. This, of course, would extend this line all the way out to the Pacific. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a, an attempt, a sleight of hand, uh, because the 3630 line, of course, applies only to the former Missouri Territory, the former Louisiana Purchase Territory. Missouri Territory, Louisiana Purchase Territory, same territories. So by this kind of sleight of hand, they had hoped to drive through now all this territory here that you see now in yellow and open it to slavery. And um, opposition in Congress catches this. And, and of course, the, the bill doesn't go any further, but it just shows you how desperate everyone is attempting. All these amendments, provisos, bills, they die in the Senate. And in March 1847, uh, Congress adjourns with American power now, extending all the way to the Pacific, but the status of slavery in New Mexico, California, Oregon, completely undetermined. Here you can see how the Louisiana Purchase looked like, that, that territory. Nineteen eight, sorry, 1848 presidential elections are approaching. The most likely candidate for the Whigs would be the party's founder, Henry Clay, but he has already run in three presidential elections and lost. Um, moreover, Clay is now associated with the Whigs' earlier opposition to the annexation of Texas and the war with Mexico. So the Whigs need to disassociate themselves from their anti-war policies prior to the war with, with Mexico, and they need to align themselves somehow with the victory in, in, in Mexico. Uh, 
And so they do this by nominating a hero of the Mexican War as their presidential candidate, General Zachary Taylor, the victor of the Battle of Buena Vista, where his troops outnumbered three to one by the Mexicans prevail over this um, charging Mexican army. Taylor owns several uh, cotton plantations with hundreds of slaves. He is this prolific slaveholder and he's entirely acceptable to the Southern faction of the Whig party. This process is now going to split the parties into various factions. The Whigs are now going to be split into Northern Whigs and Southern Whigs. The Northern Whigs are going to split again within their Northern faction between conscience Whigs who are anti-slave and cotton Whigs, Northern Whig party members who have interest in the slave industry, particularly in textiles, but they're nicknamed the cotton, the cotton Whigs. The Democratic Party is also going to split between the war Democrats, who I've described to you previously, and the anti-slavery Democrats, the few there, there are, um, who are going to get the nickname now barn burners because uh, it's it for, for anyone to be in a democratic party and to be anti-slavery is as crazy as as um, a farmer essentially burning down his own farm and so this is the beginning of kind of this decimation of the second american uh, party system as cotton wigs now begin defecting from the Whig Party to the Democratic Party. Southern Whigs as well defect to the Democratic Party. While conscience Whigs and anti-slavery Democrats, the barn burners, are going to end up forming a third party, the Free Soil Party, the first uh, party in the United States that's going to have essentially a single issue, anti-slavery, thus the Free Soil Party. And so now with a third party, this system is, is further fragmenting the stability that the United States had in, enjoyed in the first three decades, four decades of the 20th uh, century. The Free Soil Party is going to be primarily formed by Salmon P. Chase, and Salmon P. Chase will, will meet a little further on in, in, in lectures, but he's going to be as well a member of Lincoln's cabinet, he'll be the Treasury Secretary during the Civil War. And so for the first time, a presidential election is going to be marked by the issue of slavery directly now. Uh, abolitionist factions in both the Whig Party and the Democratic Party are going to be bitterly opposed to both candidates on the official party's platforms. So um, that's why you have this third party, the, the, the Free Soil Party, emerge at this time. And the Free Soil Party is going to nominate the former Democratic president, Martin Van Buren, who a lot of, let's say, progressive abolitionists had wanted to nominate originally, remember, in the election prior to the Mexican War. Here's Salmon P. Chase, the founder of the Free Soil Party. In the end, Zachary Taylor narrowly wins the 1848 elections. Some argue because of spoiler third party free soil uh, candidates. The free soilers themselves win 11 seats 
in Congress and, and now form a crucial block and a root for dissenting Whigs and Democrats in, 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 in the future. As this election is taking place through 1848, gold is being discovered in uh, California. And of course, this news, as it slowly trickles back to um, the East, it's going to trigger the great California gold rush of 1849. And this, of course, is going to change a lot of things. The Civil War is now a mere 12 years away. In 1845, Texas and Arkansas had been admitted as slave states into the Union. In August of 1848, after much debate, Oregon is organized as a territory and slavery explicitly prohibited there as it was in the Northwest Ordinance. And so now this leaves the issue of slavery in the former Mexican territories, including California, still unresolved. And so when this gold rush in 1849 um, starts to dramatically raise the population of California, it becomes a priority to admit California. And you can read in your textbook about the various machinations and, and um, attempts to somehow find a, a compromise between the various southern states and what they plan for these territories and what the north uh, plans and and it's it's getting tense. Um, Zachary Taylor displays this concerning disregard for the members of the Whig party that had nominated um, him when Zachary Taylor, on the advice of his Whig cabinet, begins to bypass the Whig press. Um, and in kind of a State of the Union address to, to Congress, Taylor, who owned slaves himself, shocks Southerners who had voted for him by announcing that he was a confirmed Unionist and that he intended to admit new territories into the Union, even if they first banned slavery before being admitted. And what we also begin to see at this time is this, this notion of popular sovereignty that um, let the people of the territory decide whether they're going to be slave or whether they're going to be a free territory. The only question is, is they haven't quite worked out the popular sovereignty model. Does the popular sovereignty model um, kick in during the constitutional phase when you have a territorial convention that is drafting a constitution, or does a territory first have to become a state and then decide whether it's going to be a um, free state or a slave state. But that Zachary Taylor was, was ready to admit states, even if, if they were free states, um, you know, the Southerners reactions was to denounce him as a traitor. One Southern congressman speaking on behalf of several Southern politicians confronts Taylor in the White House and threatens secession if Taylor proceeds to admit territories that banned slavery. Taylor will later recall, quote, I informed him that if they were taken in rebellion against the Union, I would hang them with less reluctance than I had hung deserters and spies in Mexico." End of quote. Southerners rage while Zachary Taylor presses ahead. He sends secret agents to California and to New Mexico to urge settlers to adopt state constitutions and apply for admission. California acts in October 1849. It uh, approves a free state constitution. 
and elects in November a governor and petitions Congress for statehood. New Mexico is slower in coming. New Mexico is actually getting ready to maybe go to war with Texas. Uh, they're involved in a territorial dispute between what is belonging to Texas and what might belong to New Mexico. And so Taylor now entirely alienates the Southern Whigs, further tearing that party uh, apart. January 1850, Taylor urges Congress to admit California immediately and New Mexico as soon as it's possible. And, and now Southern congressmen really begin to talk about secession, although it's still more of a threat. They're, 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 they're a, ra a radical minority. They're not quite ready to go through it. January 1850, there's a major debate in, in Congress. Henry Clay, the Whig Party leader, now introduces eight resolutions to the Senate, pairing six of them in concessions to both sides to make each side vote for one to get passage of the other. For example, the admission of California as a state is paired with provisions to organize the rest of the former Mexican territory without, quote, any restriction or conditions on the subject of slavery. <coughs> Two, the boundary dispute between Texas and New Mexico would be resolved in favor of New Mexico, thus reducing the chance of a slave state being carved out of that piece of Texas territory, but paired with compensation for Texas by the federal assumption of debts incurred during the 10 year period when Texas was an independent republic. The slave trade would be abolished in Washington, D.C., but paired with a guarantee for slavery itself. And the final pair of bills denied Congress jurisdiction of the internet, uh, sorry, of the interstate slave trade and called for stronger laws for the return of fugitive slaves from free states to slave states. So these debates um, are going on for months, as again, as James McPherson describes them well in his textbook. And eventually, um, all these bills are now combined into a single package, the omnibus bill. It covers the admission of California, the organization of the two territories from the former Mexican territory, New Mexico and Utah, without restrictions on slavery, and compensation to Texas for the loss of territory to Mexico. Instead, of making everybody happy, the omnibus, the omnibus bill makes everybody unanimously unhappy. Um, as they say, you can't please everybody um, all the time. A pro-compromise block of upper Southern Whigs and lower North Democrats supported the bill but they comprised fewer than one third of the House. The Whig Party, again, is pulled apart further, now into three factions. Taylor and most Northern Whigs wanted admission of California, believing that the acquiescence for potential slavery in New Mexico and Utah would wreck the Whig Party in the North. Lower Southern Whigs, opposed the admission of a free California. And, and, and so um, in June, things go even more into crisis mode as a convention of settlers in Santa Fe, New Mexico vote for a free state constitution. Taylor now urges the immediate admission of both California and New Mexico, further alienating the South. Texas 
threatens just to go to war and seize New Mexican territory for itself by force. And, and Zachary Taylor now stands firm preparing the United States Federal Army to intervene in Texas. And then something happens. July 4th, while attending a ceremony at the Washington Monument that's under construction at that point, Zachary Taylor gobbles down a huge amount of raw vegetables, cherries, and ice milk. And five days later, he's dead from acute gastroenteritis. And now, you know, the Whigs never seem to have good luck once they're in the presidency. And once again, um, a, pre a vice president has to take over. And in this case, it's a New York Whig, uh, Millard Fillmore. And Millard Fillmore is entirely different from Taylor. He's much more sympathetic to the interests of the South and the confrontation with the South is immediately eased when Fillmore shelves New Mexico's application for admission to the Union. In the end, um, one particular senator is going to pull all these various factions together. Stephen Douglas, he's the Democratic senator from Illinois. He's going to be Abraham Lincoln's senatorial rival in Illinois. He's nicknamed the Little Giant. He's not very tall, but very powerful. And in the summer of 1850, he breaks down the bill. And now he begins to lobby and negotiate together blocks of votes in Congress. And over the summer of 1850, the bills are passed one by one. California is admitted into the United States. The slave trade is prohibited in Washington, D.C. Texas is compensated for the loss of her territories in New Mexico. Utah and New Mexico are organized as territories without any explicit restriction put on slavery. The bill recognizing the territory of Utah and New Mexico and admitting it under federal jurisdiction, they're not states yet, um, the bill will read that they shall be received into the United States with or without slavery as their constitution may prescribe at the time of their admission. And a strong new Fugitive Slave Act is going to be enacted. So this is the direction in which popular sovereignty is beginning to um, take. Again, um, the admission of Utah in New Mexico as formal territories states that, quote, they shall be received into the United States with or without slavery as their constitution may prescribe at the time of their admission. In other words, in this case, popular sovereignty occurs at the constitutional convention level prior to the territory asking admission into um, the United States as a state. And finally, a very strong new Fugitive Slave Act is going to be enacted, the uh, Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. And many politicians either voted reluctantly or um, abstained from voting just for the sake of preserving the Union. And so this becomes known as the Compromise of 1850. And, and, and as many compromises, you know, the nature of compromise often leaves nobody happy rather than making everybody happy. And, and of course, this is yet another step 
towards war. Utah, um, it's essentially settled by Mormons. Uh, they elect as governor their church leader, the second prophet of Mormonism, Brigham Young. Um, they, when they're admitted into the United States, they will include in their state, uh, in their state constitution, the right to polygamous marriage as Mormons practiced it at that time. A handful of settlers arrive in Utah with several slaves in 1852. Utah will formally authorize slaveholding as long and uh, along with polygamy. And by the time 1860, on the eve of the Civil War, Utah, however, has only 29 slaves. So despite the fact that slavery in Utah is 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 legal, very few Utah residents actually half slaves, 29 slaves. New Mexico, it tends to be pro-North, but again in 1856, the territory passes a law curtailing the rights of free African Americans. And then in 1859, it will enact a slave cult, uh, despite the fact that uh, there were no known slaves in the territory. So there's a slave code, but no slaves. Ironically, it's California, a free state that has more slaves than the slave states of Utah and New Mexico, because California allows for slaveholders to temporarily sojourn with their slaves in the state for up to several years. So as long as you don't become a California resident, you can live there for several years with your slaves and come back and forth. So for many, the Compromise of 1850, it's thought to be the final settlement of the issues of slavery and property rights and slaves across state lines, particularly with the introduction of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which I'll get into in a second, but um, it's going to be far from a settlement. Nobody is going to be happy with this, and it's, it's going to fracture the Union further in the upcoming decade. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 is going to become a major source of friction. First thing that this slave act does is it federalizes the extradition of slaves from free territory into slave territory. Any federal marshal or other official who does not arrest an alleged runaway slave is liable to a fine of $1,000, an enormous amount of money in those days. Um, law enforcement officials everywhere now under this federal act have the duty to arrest anyone suspected of being a runaway, a runaway slave on no more evidence than a claimant's sworn testimony of ownership. The suspected slave, as before, cannot ask for a jury trial or testify on his or her own behalf. Any person aiding a runaway slave by providing food or shelter was subject to six months imprisonment and or a $1,000 fine. Police officers who capture a fugitive slave were entitled to a fee for their work. And federal marshals, the oldest agency, the Federal Marshal Service in the United States are now empowered to call out civilian posses to track down escaping slaves. No sooner 
is this law enacted in September of 1850 when in New York City, federal marshals now arrest a black porter who had lived there for three years and take him before a commissioner who refuses to listen to his pleas that he was born to a free mother and he's turned over to a man claiming to be his owner in Baltimore. Just across the river in New Jersey, in Poughkeepsie, slave catchers sees a prosperous black tailor who had lived there for years and carry him off to South Carolina. In Indiana, a black man who had escaped 19 years ago is seized and returned to his former owner in the South. And, and now slave catching becomes a big business under the protection of the federal government. And, and you begin to see these symbols, as you can see here, of a runaway slave. These are um, type elements that newspapers use as kind of a quick, quick um, symbol of a runaway slave. And, and these wanted ads will appear throughout the United States. The issue becomes most acute in Boston, the capital of the abolitionist movement. A married slave couple, William and Ellen Craft, managed to escape from, from Georgia. Ellen is light-skinned, probably biracial. She crops her hair short and poses as William's sickly male owner on the way north for treatment with his slave. And they managed to make their way by train all the way out to Boston. And once they settle in Boston, they become visible and vocal members of an abolitionist congregation there. No sooner is the Fugitive Slave Act passed when Kraft's owner now vows to recover his escaped slaves. October 25th, 1850, slave catchers now arrive in Boston to seize the craft. Armed vigilantes in Boston now protect the crafts and the slave catchers are harassed and threatened by mobs to such an extent that five days later, they leave without being able to capture the crafts and bring them back to their owner in Georgia. President Fillmore is outraged. He condemns the Boston vigilantes and threatens in to send the federal troops. He contacts the Kraft's owner in Georgia and assures him that if he wanted to again attempt to seize his slaves, he would be provided with assistance from the federal government as per the Constitution and the new Fugitive Slave Act. And so the Crafts have to instead flee to England in November of 1850. There they'll have five children, they'll attend agricultural training school, they'll write this book, running a thousand miles for freedom um, and they'll continue to be anti-slavery activists right in through the war. Uh, 1868 following the American Civil War the Crafts returned to the United States with two of their children and they settle in Way Station, Georgia near Savannah. This kind of mob action, protecting slaves, these anti-slavery vigilantes continue to carry on their activities throughout this period. February 1851, when federal marshal sees a black waiter who had escaped from Virginia a year earlier, um, a group of vigilantes overwhelm the marshals and rescue the waiter, eventually smuggling him all the way to Canada. Um, four whites and 
um, a number of African Americans are indicted for violation of the Fugitive Slave Act for this episode, but a Boston jury of their peers acquits them. April 1851, um, the might of the federal government now comes down in aiding the extradition of an escaped slave. Thomas Sims, an escaped slave from Virginia, is discovered in Boston. The mayor allows the Boston police to be deputized now by federal marshals. The courthouse is sealed and when federal commissioners order Sims extradition to Virginia, some 500 federal army troops escort the prisoner aboard a ship bound for the South. And along the route where Sims is being marched by the army toward the ship that's going to carry him back to slavery in Virginia, anti-slavery protesters hang the American flag out their windows upside down. That's when that mode of expressing dissent in the United States becomes enshrined in American custom. Um, hanging a flag upside down is an acceptable way to this day for Americans to protest the conduct of their government. Um, you can't, well, I guess you can now burn the flag, but um, there was a time when that was considered a, a, a crime. It's, it's Supreme Court ruled that it's not, but it is unacceptable to set the American flag on fire, at least in, in, in American custom. But to fly the flag upside down as an act of protest is, is, is completely acceptable in American custom. And, and that's where it begins with that, that slave extradition in April of 1851. That's where that custom begins. September, oh, and as well, of course, um, you begin to see these warning posters warning African Americans that they can no longer trust police officers in Boston or Watchmen. At one time, we remember, you know, why we had to have that case, Prig versus Pennsylvania, police officers would protect um, escaped slaves or any African American from being seized by um, bounty hunters. Not anymore. Now, police officers are not only given a bounty if they um, render a, an escaped slave, but they as well can face a fine of $1,000 if they do not. So that's a major change. September 11th, 1851, um, now for the first time, somebody gets killed. It's um, in the Quaker community of Christiana, Pennsylvania. Um, a shootout now ensues between people protecting escaped slaves and uh, the slave owner and his men attempting to recover his property. The slave owner is shot dead and his son is seriously wounded. Some newspapers at that time report this as the start of the Civil War, the Battle of Christiana. And, and in, in, in fact, um, some historians suggest perhaps this is the first shot um, in, in the Civil War. It, it's not exactly, but certainly metaphorically it is. President Fillmore, once again, calls out the Marines they flood into the Pennsylvania countryside searching for the offenders who rescued the escaped slave. When they're caught, they're charged not only in violation of the Fugitive Slave Act, but for treason as well. Again, a jury 
of their peers acquits the defendants um, and and once they're defendant in once the defendants are acquitted in the Pennsylvania trial, the federal government decides not to charge them further under under federal law. In Syracuse, New York, mobs of abolitionists raid a police station where an escaped slave is being held, and again, spear them off to Canada. May of 1854, by then, um, Franklin Pierce is going to be the president. Uh, Pierce will send Marines, cavalry, and artillery to Boston to enforce an extradition of an escaped uh, slave to Virginia. Once again, mobs attempt to free the slave. They kill a federal marshal, but they're unsuccessful. When abolitionists offer to pool money and purchase the slave, U.S. federal prosecutor refuses to allow them to do so, even if the owner agrees to sell. And U.S. federal government now insists that the law take its course. And that's another reason Americans are hanging a, uh, the flag upside down now and, and draping buildings in mourning black as well. That was another form of uh, protest that they take. Here you can see another illustration of the Battle of Christiana. July. Fourth, America's high holiday, Independence Day. Abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison now shocks Americans. Still to this day, when during the celebrations of the American Declaration of Independence, he now holds up a copy of the American Constitution and declares it a covenant with death and an agreement with hell, end of quote. And then Garrison sets fire to the Constitution, proclaiming, quote, so perish all compromise with tyranny and let all the people say amen, end of quote. This begins to split the abolitionist movement between a majority which advocates essentially peaceful protest and a minority that is calling for armed resistance and vigilante groups. And secessionists in the South are beginning to point to these events, arguing that the terms of the South remaining in the Union were being violated by rebellion in the North against the provisions of the Constitution. If the Constitution was being ignored in the North, then it was nothing short of tyranny. What keeps the United States together is a period where the price of cotton has been rising for over a decade. It keeps many Southerners conservative, many Southerners are pro-union because it's good business. And unionist factions begin to rise up both in the Whig and Democratic Party against Southern rights factions. Unionists will win several governorships in the ensuing years in Georgia, in Mississippi. Um, in fact, uh, in Mississippi, there's um, 14 of, sorry, I should say, um, 14 of the 19 congressmen for Georgia, Mississippi, and Alabama are unionists. 
And so with these electoral advances being made by Northerners, they believe that the, se the secessionist movement in the South is waning. It's an idle threat. Um, and, and moreover, the kind of dramatic extraditions of slaves begin to slow down as well. Because of course now there is a tendency for escaped slaves like the crafts who learned from that experience to keep a lower, lower profile once they arrive in the free state. And they now start continuing to run north on what becomes known as the Underground Railway until they reach the safety of Canada. Here's the resolution that William Lloyd Garrison read on the 4th of July, resolved that the compact which exists between the North and the South is a covenant with death and an agreement with hell involving both parties in, atro in atrocious criminality and should be immediately annulled. The Underground Railroad, it's not really a railroad, that's just the nickname, but it's a, um, a number of underground supporters that set up kind of like railway stations, places of refuge for escaped slaves. Um, it's organized by Harriet Tubman, who's later a Union Army nurse, a spy, armed scout, and, and, and combatant. It, um, we understand now why it, you know, it is necessary for slaves. It's not enough for them just to escape to Pennsylvania or to New York. They have to go all the way to Canada. Um, there are huge African American communities in Canada at this point now. Here's, you can see African American women at Ontario House in uh, Toronto. We, as Canadians often take great pride in how we used to give shelter to slaves, but really it's a bit of a, of, 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 of a myth as to why we used to do it, because of course we've got to remember that Canada, when the war begins, is going to end up supporting the Confederacy. Um, the, prior to 1850, we did not exactly welcome escaped slaves. In fact, in 1837, um, just around the time of the rebellion, there is a, a a riot and an attempt again by anti-slave vigilantes to rescue a slave that a Niagara Falls sheriff is extraditing across the river back to the United States. We used to extradite slaves running to Canada. The reason that in 1850, after the passage of the 1850 um, the Fugitive Slave Act that Canadians begin welcoming slaves here is really not out of our love or um, concern for the plight of African Americans. It's out of our hate for the American Republic. You have to remember that in 1850, in the British Empire, republicanism was still seen as the way we would see communism in the 20th century or the way we view radical Islam today, essentially as threats to our own value systems. And back then it was the monarchy. And uh, you only re need to read church sermons given throughout the 19th century in Toronto's churches on the satanic evil of republicanism and the republic. So um, we happily begin admitting escaped African Americans here. Essentially, it's a way for us to stick our thumb in the eye of Washington, D.C., the republic that had introduced this federal law. It's, it's a way for us to trip them up. 
So um, here she is, Harriet Tubman, the founder of the Underground Railroad. And indeed, as I say, it's a, it's a fascinating story. She um, is a Union Army nurse. As I say, she's an armed scout. She actually fights during the Civil War. And after the war, Harriet Tubman will um, live long enough to participate in the field, in the, in, in the, the women's suffrage movement. She'll pass away in 1913, um, what, uh, five years, uh, six years short of seeing American women get the vote. And when she dies in 1913, her last words are, quote, I go to prepare a place for you, end of quote. Major figure in um, the anti-slavery movement. And, and certainly um, a early female African-American militant. There's monuments to her everywhere. She's nicknamed um, Moses because she leads her people to freedom. The 1850 Fugitive Slave Act also galvanizes 39-year-old Harriet Beecher Stowe into action. Harriet is the daughter of Lyman Beecher, an abolitionist congregationalist. She grows up in her family's abolitionist movement in Cincinnati, Cincinnati, Ohio. This is, of course, the home state of Salmon P. Chase, where the Free Soil Party is, is founded. It's also Ohio is a hot spot for abolitionism. She ends up marrying Calvin Ellis Stowe, a clergyman and a university professor. They end up settling in Brunswick, Maine. After the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act, Beecher experiences a series of visions that drive her, she says, to write a novel about the suffering of a fictional family of slaves that are broken up and sold by their owners. The book is based on her own knowledge of the Underground Railway that she gained from her family's activities in Cincinnati and from a series of interviews she had conducted with former slaves. When Uncle Tom's Cabin comes out in 1852, it's the first American novel with an African-American protagonist, and it becomes an instant bestseller. It sells an extraordinary 10,000 copies in the first week and 300,000 in the first year. I should be so lucky with my own books. Um, by 1854, it is translated into 60 different languages, and it sells several million copies worldwide. The book is going to be produced as a play, uh, which is equivalent in those days of being made into a movie. Um, and even Queen Victoria weeps when she reads the book. The book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, is going to have an incredible effect on, on Northern states. Um, it, it becomes this kind of, I don't wanna use the term necessarily propaganda because of the negative connotations with, this, with that term, but that's what it is essentially, is propaganda and it draws people to, it inspires people to join the abolitionist movement. Um, and it, 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 it just 
puts enormous fire under the cause of abolitionism in the United States, and it internationalizes it as well, uh, as is being translated into all these different languages around the world, but especially in England, where it kind of the international slave trade, the movement for the abolition of the international slave trade kind of took root. Um, this book begins to draw and focus the world's criticism of the United States. Um, in, in the, it's in, you know, the United States is embarrassed in the world community where most Western countries have now ban slavery, but the United States, which claims to be this great democratic advanced country, uh, still practices this kind of uncivilized institution of, 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 of slavery. In the South, um, it's, it's banned and um, its mere possession will become a criminal offense. But around the world, it sells millions of, of, of copies. I would like to say that it makes Harriet Beecher Stowe a millionaire, but it probably didn't considering um, the way copyright laws used to work back then. Now, James McPherson points out in his textbook that the term Uncle Tom is a disparaging one among militant African Americans, especially in the 1960s. I, I don't hear the term often used today, but I did hear it in the 1960s, uh, particularly after the Civil Rights Act and, and um, a lot of African Americans became more militant when the Civil Rights Act did not kind of bring the kind of racial harmony that was intended. And, and so the term Uncle Tom begins to be applied to those African Americans who are considered to be servile or fawning to their white oppressors. And it's a term, as I say, that appears in the 1960s when militant Black Party activists in the U.S like Huey Newton, Bobby Seale, um, Eldridge Cleaver, Stokely Carmichael began to regard passive resistors like Martin Luther King as Uncle Tom's. The Black Panther Party is a as I say, a radical movement. They um, often were composed of returning Vietnam War veterans who were radicalized by what they saw in Vietnam. They uh, very much like Black World War I soldiers who went to fight in France for democracy and then return to a Jim Crow America where um, they were living in a segregated society. It was the same kind of experience for many um, African Americans who fought in the war and, and, and then returned back to the United States to face this kind of continuing oppression that um, African Americans were experiencing since the abolition of slavery and never mind during slavery that uh, that's obvious and and so they begin exercising their second amendment rights to bear arms they begin organizing they begin confronting white power in a way that it was never seen before in in the in people's faces um, this ran parallel with general disorder and protest in the United States. It wasn't just 
African Americans, whites were protesting other issues as 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 well. Um, you, you had radical movements um, growing out of the hippies, the the yippies. Um, you had domestic anti-war terrorists, the weather underground, as as they were known. Um, the response from the police at at that time in places like Chicago or New Orleans was Detroit was often to just um, kill these activists. They they would bust in the door, um, shoot somebody in their bed, and then toss in a, a handgun and say, "Well, you know." Um, the guy resisted. This is, of course, all before body cams, before cell phones. Um, none of this, you know, could be documented. And 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 so, as Black Panther members started arming and now shooting back, they began killing police officers. And 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 then, of course, they end up on trial on um, a murder charge. And Black Panthers began to appear at courthouses and state houses. Weapons out. And as some activists found themselves sitting in courtrooms facing a death sentence for murder, um, some of the most radical Black Panthers began just taking the judges hostage and rescuing the defendants. This was a, a, you know, what we're seeing today compared to the mid to late 1960s is, you know, kindergartens, kids playing um, what, what we're seeing right now happening in the United States. Back then, um, you know, this judge was dead within about a minute of this photograph being taken. So um, that term, Uncle Tom, as I said, was, was applied to um, pacifist civil rights advocates like Martin Luther King. And of course, when Martin Luther King is assassinated in 1968, uh, you know, a lot of Black Panthers and radical African Americans said, you know, you see, uh, that's what what, what happens. So, um, as as McPherson points out, that um, again in his textbook, that image of the fawning Uncle Tom, it really isn't in the book. It emerges from the sappy theatrical plays that were based on the book, not the book itself. According to McPherson. Uncle Tom, as portrayed by Beecher, is a Christ-like figure tormented by civil authorities who dies for the sins of mankind in order to save not only his own people, but the oppressors as, as well. As McPherson writes in his textbook, quote, Stowe's readers lived in an age that understood this message better than ours. <laughs> 